One of the things that I am just passionately interested in is having people with commitment to Jesus and commitment to Scripture find unity, a true unity together. So when I came to Western uh, as a new prof in 1980, uh, Western is basically uh, on the Reformed side of the spectrum. Uh, and so there was another Western in town, Western Evangelical Seminary, and it's on the Wesleyan side of the, of the map. And traditionally, Reformed people and Wesleyan people don't talk to each other. They argue with each other. So I called Stan Johnson, who was the theology prof, prof there at Wes, and said, hey, can I buy you lunch? And he was really suspicious, but free lunch, he said, yeah, I'll do that. So I went over and talked to him, and we formed a great friendship, and I learned a lot about stuff. And what I've discovered is, as long as you've got a commitment to Jesus and got a commitment to Scripture and are interested in achieving unity, it's amazing what you can do. So in your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, I want to start out with this passage. We did discover kind of a fun thing tonight. My computer will not plug into the system here. So I'm using Zach's computer here, and I really it's, a, it's one of those Buddhist computers. You know, one of those Mac things. What do you mean? Oh, what are you talking about? Just tell me Steve Jobs is not a Buddhist. Well, he's not anymore. He was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, and note what I have here, a Buddhist iPad. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, Paul is transitioning from the more doctrine side to the more life side, that those two are not disconnected. Uh, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling which you have received. And here's a key. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. And then this is kind of my theme verse for tonight. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And then he goes on, there's one body, one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope uh, when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And he, yeah, amen. Uh, and he goes from there. And that's what I want to think about tonight, uh, the, the importance of doctrine and how do we achieve unity as Christians within this basic idea of a, of a doctrine and a commitment with that? So what I want to do tonight is I want to give you kind of a framework to think about how to achieve unity. Uh, and then I want us to just have a conversation. I mean, I've got plenty to say, but I hate lecturing. So, Ezra, I love you. That's great. Yeah, good thing. Uh, in this... Uh, in this thing together, what I want to do here is think of four levels of essentiality. So, when I essentiality, I don't know, four levels of certainty or something like that. And when I think of these four, what helps me a lot is uh, there, uh, the way my friend Driscoll puts it, he said there are some closed hand issues. There are some open hand issues, or sometimes you talk about there are national borders versus state borders. State borders, you go right and forth, back across, but there is a border there. National borders, you've got to show your passport and that kind of stuff. I think we can draw down just a little bit further than that. So let me give you what I'm thinking about here, and then we'll talk about it. First of all, when I think about this, there, there are the die for issues. And what we mean when we say die for is that these are the biblical essentials. When we think about die for issues, these are the things like the inspiration and authority of Scripture. That would be one example, and I want to unpack with you what are some other things that would fit in these different areas. And these things are what the Bible clearly teaches as essential. And inspiration and authority of Scripture would be one of those, uh, where Second. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 talks about all scripture, all the writings are inspired of God, theopneustia, and are useful for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And for somebody who doesn't believe in inspiration and authority of scripture, we don't, we, there really can be no unity at that point. If you think the Bible is just a human book of a 2,000-year-old book of religious wisdom, uh, 
you know, well, really, what I would suggest at that point is to deny these things knowingly would be to deny Christ. And which is to say that in a real sense, if you really, knowing what you're doing, deny these things, you can't call yourself a Christian. Now, an example of that, and a, a controversial issue, would be Mormons. Is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint, do they deserve the title Christian? Now, we're not talking about they're nice people, we're not talking about there are a lot of Mormons who are worshipers of Jesus, that's certainly true. But the church as it teaches, the official teaching of the LDS church, can they deserve the term Christian? Well, do they believe the inspiration and authority of scripture as we have it today? And what's the answer? They don't. What do they believe about the scripture we have today by their own teaching? What do they say? They say it's corrupted. The Bible that we have today is not the word of God. Uh, in just while we're at it here, do, does the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believe in the deity of Jesus, the one who was born at Bethlehem and died at Calvary? Do they believe in the deity of Jesus? Shall I take a vote? <laughs> what do they believe about Jesus? Do you know? He's the son of Elohim. He's the brother of Satan and the brother of who else? All human beings. There is no qualitative difference between the one who's incarnate as Jesus and me. We're all exactly at the same level, human spirits, son of mother God and father God. And so do they believe that Jesus from Bethlehem to Calvary was God with us? And the answer is no, no, by their own teaching. Now what they do believe is that he is on the track toward deity and he'll be God of his own world in the next cycle, but he's not God in this world. Pardon? Uh, probably not us, yeah. Uh, in fact, I'm pre I've been told by a fairly high level LDS fellow that I am a son of perdition. My, the one who's incarnate in this body rebelled with Satan back in the day. And uh, I don't know how he knew that except that I wasn't on his team. Uh, but it's, uh, see, that's a place where when you ask who is a Christian, and I think of the official teaching of the LDS church, and again, I'm not talking about individual Mormons. There are a lot of individual Mormons who are just simple worshipers, Jesus, who like the community, and they just don't buy into some of the teaching of the church. But the church as an organization does not believe in the deity of Jesus. Do they believe in, uh, can they say the Apostles' Creed? Which begins with, I believe in God the Father, maker, oh, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Can they say that? And the answer is no, they can't. Who is the God of this world? Well, he was a human in the previous cycle, and he is not the creator of heaven and earth. He may have been on a committee that created this planet. See? He's a Presbyterian. <laughs> No, no, I don't think that's quite the answer to it. Yeah, But see, the thing of it is, I, what I'm saying here is this is, is a die for. If you deny these kinds of things, you have excluded yourself from the fellowship of Jesus Christ, I would say. Uh, and they would say the same thing about me. Uh, so that's what we're thinking about when we think of a die for type thing. Okay, questions, comments, because you get a chance to be real interactive in this. Questions about die force? We're going to put some names on these here in just a little bit. So be thinking about what you think should fit here. Cult? cult? What do you mean by cult? There's lots of cults out there. Yes. That, that, you know, take the Bible and it. That's correct. And some of the cults uh, would, they're what we call Christian cults. They're like discipleship groups. They're hyper-disciple groups and things like that. Their doctrine would be fine, but their practice goes against uh, wisdom and such. But there are many others, of course, that take certain themes of Scripture and distort them. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, would say the one incarnate in Jesus is Michael, the first, the archangel, and not divine, though very great. So yeah, there are a lot of cults. Okay, so that's the first level. 
die for. Uh, second level, uh, these names come from my friend Steve Walker, are the divide for things. And the divide fours are issues so central that we can't be in the same fellowship. Uh, we agree that uh, we're Christians. We agree that when we die, we're going to be with Jesus. Uh, we can participate together in certain kinds of things. But when it comes to being in the same church, we just can't get along well enough on these. And an example of this, a historic place of differentiation, are the sacraments. If you know your church history, you know that John Calvin and Martin Luther split over the meaning of the Eucharist. They had other differences, and they could get along with those, but their fundamental difference in understanding of real presence, and uh, just they couldn't work together. So can somebody explain to me what a, a Catholic view of Eucharist is? Transubstantiation, which means what? Okay, if I take a piece of bread from the Eucharist and take it to a chemist and said, tell me what this is, this is a consecrated piece of Roman Catholic bread from the Eucharist, and I took it to a chemist and said, what is this, what would they say? They would say, it's just bread. But the priest tells me it's body of Christ. It's literally the body of Jesus. How can that be? Well, the Roman Catholic answer is the essence or substance is flesh of Jesus, but the attributes are bread. Same way for the wine. The essence is blood of Christ, but the attributes are, are just wine. So if you taste it or take it to a chemist, it's bread and wine, but the essence has changed. Luther said nonsense. That, it's just, that's just bread. What Luther said is in that piece of bread, Christ is concentratedly present. So if I take that piece of bread, Jesus is everywhere, but in that piece of bread, he is very, very concentratedly present. Calvin said, hogwash, that's just bread for crying out loud. There's nothing special about that. Christ is present in the service by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Calvin and Luther, Calvin said, that's just bread. And he said, no, no, that is, Jesus said, this is my body. And they had such a falling out that they split over that central issue. Uh, and uh, he went from there. Uh, so here we affirm our unity as Christians. Uh, and we think of Saul and Barnabas who split over what? Brothers to bring John and Mark. Well, what was the doctrine thing they split over? Remember, they had a, a tiff over what they, John Mark had left on the first journey, and they're getting ready to go on the second journey, and they split over whether they should take him or not. And it had the theology thing is what is the proper place of a man in ministry? And I can imagine the argument between them. Paul is saying, John, come on, Barnabas, I know you're the encourager, but... John Mark, he's a great guy, but he's a pastor. He's not a, he's not a cutting edge ministry. You're going to put him in a place where he's going to fail. And Barnabas is saying, Saul, come on, just believe in him. I know he can do it. He's such a good man. Let's get, and he wants to go. Let's let him go. Who is right? It's not really a matter of right or wrong. It's a matter that they differ over something really essential and you can see a good case for either side as I'm reconstructing this. People tend to make Paul the legalist and Barnabas the good guy, but I don't think that's the way it came down. But they divided over that. Each one took another partner. Uh, Barnabas took John Mark and went to Cyprus. Paul took Silas and went on the missionary journey. And what happened? The kingdom of God was multiplied. But there's a rift between those two. Uh, and what happens here is there is a rift and I think at this point we need to affirm our unity, but it's hard to do. Okay? One more. The, uh, the debate for. And in the debate for, these are issues where we disagree and we growl at each other. 
but work positively and laugh together in the same fellowship. And I'm going to ask you, as you see it, not what should be, but what is, what are some debate for issues? And when I'm thinking of debate for issues, I'm, these are places where we should disagree productively in the fellowship, and we should seek a true unity in Christ and his work, be of one mind and one spirit. So that's what I think of when I think of the debate fours. Uh, and these will change over a period of time sometimes, and they'll certainly change by culture and such, but I want to think what are some debate fours uh, in our society. So be thinking about these things, because I'm asking you a little bit. So what's the first one? Die for. And if you deny it knowingly, you're denying Christ. The second is what? Divide for. The third one is? Debate for. What's the fourth one? The fourth one is decide for. Just put some D's on there. If you don't like D's, uh, I can give you C's. Certain, convinced, confused, clueless. You know, that, that works the same kind of way. So we can say there is a certain, uh, there is con convinced, Convinced. This Buddhist computer is rebelling against me. <laughs> there is uh, confused and there is clueless. Uh, and that would be another way to, to look at that with the four uh, levels there. Decide for, when I think about those, that's issues where the difference is really no issue. Uh, and these are placed, the, the Greek word for this is adiaphora which is the uh, no law kind of thing. And the thing is to encourage freedom in as many areas as possible, according to Romans 1.14. So, die for, divide for, debate for, decide for. Now, this is your turn. I want you to tell me, uh, and we, we were going to discuss this a little bit, I want you to tell me here, uh, what, as you look at the church today, what are some divide for issues in the church today? And I'm talking about pe evangelicals, people are committed to Jesus, people are committed to scripture. Other than sacraments, what are some points that churches divide for? What? Baptism is a sacrament. We already mentioned that one, so you don't get to do that one. Yeah, you're right. Baptism is a historic place of division. Without Drummy. <laughs> that doesn't work. Let's see. Yeah, this Buddhist computer doesn't do anything right. It's very frustrating. Tell me a little bit more. Okay. Or Friday? Okay. So we're thinking here which day you must worship on. Uh, hmm. So what would be some examples? Said Vandist. Mm -hmm. Yep. Seventh day Adventist, Seventh day Baptist, there are a number of those, and they believe that we should. That's correct. Yep. What did, Jesus, what did God say? Six days shall work, the seventh day is a Sabbath. Rest unto the Lord, do no work. Uh, and so they believe we should keep the Sabbath. 
Others would say, no, it's not Sabbath day, it's Lord's day. What passage would the Lord's day people appeal to? Of course, the Sabbath day people appeal to the Ten Commandments, which is a fairly good level of authority. Pardon? Book of Revelation. Yep. Revelation chapter 1, he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Of course, that was him doing his devotions, not having a church service. Colossians chapter 2 talks about having every day as a, as a day for the Lord. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's quite a debate around that. Uh, I was raised with a Christian Sabbath, so we used Sunday as Sabbath day, and we weren't allowed to do any work on Sunday. We were able to feed our animals and such on the farm, but uh, you couldn't do anything beyond that. Couldn't do any worldly pleasures or something like that. Mm -hmm. So Sabbath, yeah, what day must you worship on? Others? Gifts? Tell me what you mean by that. Nobody speaks in tongues anymore, do they? <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the issue of... Uh, I'm going to be a little more specific on this. The uh, issue of cessationism and continuation. And the key difference here, the place where the biggest difference is and the most significant difference in this area is we all evangelicals believe that God speaks in Scripture today. Nobody, no evangelicals is going to debate that. No biblical Christian is going to debate. God does speak in Scripture today. The question is, does he speak special revelation beyond Scripture? So a cessationist says no the only place god speaks today where god speaks special revelation is in scripture continuationists says no god continues to speak to reveal himself uh, by personally speaking to individuals or groups uh, and he continues to do that today now do continuationists believe that we're going to add to the bible now, careful, ask trick questions. Do continuations believe that we should add to the Bible these things that God has spoken? The answer is no. Everybody agrees that the canon of Scripture is closed. That is, there's, the Bible has finished writing with the writing of the apostles. Nobody, no evangelical is adding to Scripture. Now, there are other non-evangelicals that do add to Scripture. The people who are continuationists firmly believe that the canon of Scripture is closed and that Scripture is the ultimate authority. And, uh, and again, evangelical continuationists are going to believe that a new revelation from God must be tested. The only trustworthy revelation is revelation in Scripture. All other revelation must be tested. Cessationists argue God said everything you need to say about Jesus in the Bible that's it. Now we live by spirit-enabled wisdom, but we do not expect God to speak today. Okay. Now, comments, questions about this? Well, that becomes a bit... Uh, uh, the, the line becomes blurred when you talk about God speaking to an individual with particular guidance for a specific issue. Yeah. Uh, so... Yeah. It, is, it is really interesting to see cessationist pastors say, God told me to move to the bigger church with a bigger salary. It's just <laughs> ironic. You know, it, I, just, I can't help but kind of get ex What was that? Somebody said that over here. Uh, that, uh, are they really cessationist? And the answer, yes, they are. They just like to pass the book on responsibility. Uh, and, and we just have to laugh and, in derision about that. You know, bring your practice in, in the context of your, your doctrine. Uh, but what happens, cessationists are going to say it's Scripture plus wisdom, and they'll grant the Holy Spirit works in wisdom, but they say that God doesn't speak today. Other comments on this? Yes, here. 
How does he answer your prayers? Really good question. The cessationist would say, if I ask God, say, to uh, give me grace to confront a difficult situation, he will do that. But he won't tell me what to say to the difficult person. The continuationist will say, God will tell me, may, tell me something specifically to say to that person. That would be kind of the difference between you. So he answers prayers, but if you say, God, tell me what to say, he won't do that. He'll give you scripture and he'll give you wisdom to go with it. That'd be the cessationist answer. Good question. Others? Yeah, you had one back here. Uh, that's, that's Acts chapter 2. Uh, the thing you're quoting there, it's quoting from Joel, and it's quoted in Acts chapter 2, and what they would say is during the time of, this is cessationist, uh, would say that is during the apostolic period, and in those days that would happen, but that has ceased. Now that we have scripture, we don't need that anymore. That would be the cessationist argument. The continuationist argument would be, yes, that's true during the entire church age, that all people will have that immediate presence of God and that God will speak. And again, this is a point of division. I haven't even told you where I come out on this debate yet. Uh, I will when we get done. But not right. Yes, those, those things, Holy Spirit as counselor and guide, they would argue those promises were spoken to the apostles there in the upper room discourse, and that was their work. Now we have scripture, which is illumined by the Holy Spirit, but God no longer speaks in that way. Now they do believe in the Holy Spirit working today. He regenerates, he empowers for sanctification, he empowers for good works, all those things they absolutely believe in, but they don't believe he speaks today. Uh, yes, that particular work is no longer happening. That was something he did with the apostles. And when their work is finished, then that's done. Just like the Old Testament law, the Mosaic law, we no longer do sacrifices. How come? The purpose of that is finished. It's all done. So the idea there is there's a season for things, and when that season is done, God will move to a new way of doing things. That would be the cessationist argument. They don't say he stops being who he is, but the way he works will change. They'd say the same thing, again, cessationist speaking. During the Old Testament, God, or the Holy Spirit did not do things that he now does under the New Covenant. And actually, most people would agree that it's a change with the start of the New Covenant because that's when God says, I'll pour out my Spirit on all people. So something new happened at Pentecost, so there is a change that happens at that point. And, of course, there's a lot of argument about exactly what that change is. Good questions. Really good questions. Thank you. You had one too, sir. Could you speak to uh, cessation and continuation with respect to the second coming? Uh, everybody believes in the second coming of Jesus to die for. I'm not sure what you're asking. Oh, well, he's going to come back, so yeah. is Scripture going to be added to with that? I, will there be more Scripture added at the second coming of Jesus? That's a place where most people will say there may well be something added to Scripture. Others would say, no, there won't be because we have Jesus present with us. In fact, the purpose of Scripture may be completely finished. If you remember the 1 Corinthians 13 passage, there will be a day when uh, prophecy and tongues and knowledge will be ceased because we will see him face to face. And many people will say, well, that when Jesus is with us, then we won't need the Bible anymore because Jesus will be right here. So a lot of people are going to say the Bible will cease its purpose and we just put it back on the shelf and just go directly to Jesus. Now, again, not everybody would agree with that, but many would. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there another die for or another divide for we want to put up here? I mean, there Okay, style of government, yep. So let's just call that, in a general sense, uh, church polity. 
What would be a couple of polity issues? I don't want to spend a lot of time on this one, but like what? Oh, now that's a whole different one. <laughs> Say that again. Everybody agrees on those. Mm -hmm. yeah, Dave Lomas was here last time and talked about some of those things. I, I will, I mean, this, this is a very, very debated issue right now. But most people committed to biblical authority are going to, most, not all, it's a divide point, are going to say that homosexual activity, that is, sexual activity outside of marriage, is sinful, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual. Uh, that sexual activity outside of marriage would be sinful. That would be people committed to Jesus in Scripture. There would be large-scale agreement with that. The issue, of course, of homosexual marriage is a much debated issue right now. And uh, the church, I mean, obviously, I clearly have my opinions on that. I think marriage is a man and a woman uh, faithful to each other for life. And that the, yeah, I'll stand with that. Yeah, I, I really believe that. I mean, the biblical statements are real clear. People sometimes, I'll just say a moment on that. I don't want to get off on that because that'll take all the rest of our time. Uh, People often say, I've got some friends who describe themselves as red-letter Christians. Have you heard that phrase? Red-letter Christians is about what? The words of Jesus. And what they say is, Jesus is really authority. Paul and Leviticus, and they're, in, they're not on the same level. So they would describe themselves as red-letter Christians. And so we'll follow the words of Jesus. I... Uh, and so what I do when I talk to those folk, get your Bible out and I'll just tell you what I do. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a troublemaker at heart. You just need to know that. So I say, I always want to take people to Scripture. I just really, really, really believe that's the thing to do. And uh, so I will take them to, I'll say, would you turn to Mark, please? Mark chapter 7. Uh, and they say, why do you want to go there? I say, well, I, I, you're a red-letter Christian, so let's go to red-letter stuff. In uh, Mark chapter 7, starting at verse 20, what does Jesus say? He wanted to say, what comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it is from within, out of a person's hearts, that evil thoughts come. And here's the evil. Sexual immorality. Porneia. What is porneia? This is Mark seven twenty one. What is porneia? Remember, Jesus is speaking in a Jewish context. Pornea would be anything that would go against the sexual law of marriage, one man, one woman. And so here Jesus is defining, he is saying it's evil for pornea, and pornea is any sexual activity outside of marriage. Okay? Where was that? Mark 7, 21. And then say, okay, let's look at one more passage. Go to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. Uh, the Pharisees come and says, The law for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason. This is Matthew 19. Haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? For this reason a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. How is Jesus defining marriage? One man, one woman, husband and wife for life. And what he's saying in Mark 7 is any sexual activity outside of marriage would be evil. And what he's saying here is that marriage is one man and one woman. So, yeah, okay, I'll be a red-letter Christian. It doesn't have a different morality than anywhere else in Scripture, I will argue. And, and I'll do that. Now, the other thing, and I'll, I'll say one more thing and I'll quit. We must, 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 must make a differentiation between sexual activity and sexual attraction. Uh, sexual attraction, lustfulness, is a sinful thing, but there's a difference between sexual attraction and sexual activity. Virtually all of us have warped sexual attraction of one sort or another. And what God says is shepherd that sexual attraction in biblical ways. So for me, that means to take my sexual attractions and focus them on my pretty wife, Sherry. 
and, uh, and that's his command to me. Uh, some people have real difficulty doing that because what I call high T men, I mean, yeah, some of you are laughing. You know what I'm talking about. That's the men who everything that has a skirt is a lustful object. And what that is, if you start fantasizing or encouraging that kind of attraction, that's sin. But the fact that I have those attractions by itself is not sin. I mean, any more than anything else, because we've all got sin type stuff. But it's a, a shepherd that according to biblical guidelines. Now, this is going to be a huge, 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 already is, dividing issue in the evangelical church. And I think if you make that one distinction, you will clarify a lot of things. The difference between sexual activity, which anything outside of marriage is sin, and sexual attraction, which says we shepherd it according to biblical standards. Could somebody who had same-sex attraction become a pastor of a church? A lot of debate. My answer is yes, absolutely. I know a couple of really, really good pastors uh, in good, solid evangelical churches who wrestle with same-sex attraction. And I know some, a lot of pastors who wrestle with opposite-sex attraction. But they shepherd it according to biblical standards, and they're very, very effective pastors. So make that distinction between sexual activity and sexual attraction, and you'll get rid of a lot of the problems. Because uh, we, can, we can absolutely shepherd our activity, and we can do a lot with our attractions by the power of the Holy Spirit, and, the, and so it's a good thing. I'm way off topic. What are we, you guys are bad for me. Uh, divide four. Okay, let's think now. Uh, what are some... What's the next one? What's the next one? Debate four. So, debate four. What would be some debate for things? Prophecy. Prophecy is a con cessation continuation. Alcohol. Alcohol? Why would you put that up there? And they can be in the same fellowship? It's debatable. <laughs> <laughs> You guys are good. I'm enjoying this. This is great. Yeah. Uh -huh. You're getting into this really well. Uh, alcohol, I can spell sometimes. Except on Buddhist computers, for crying out loud. Alcohol, yeah. Alcohol. Yeah. Oh, something like that. A-L. Sheesh. Okay, alcohol. Yay! All right, alcohol. Yeah. Now, you know it's interesting if you're Southern Baptist, it's a divide for for your leadership. Southern Baptists, all their leaders, pardon? Or Salvation Army. Or Salvation Army. Okay, I don't mean just, uh, but it's, it, you are, as a leader, uh, you sign a covenant that says you will not partake in alcoholic beverages as a Southern Baptist or Southern Army, uh, Salvation Army. Uh, when I was teaching at Biola, uh, we had a lifestyle agreement there uh, that said that I would not partake in alcoholic beverages or dancing or something like that. And what are you laughing about? Yeah, I mean, it's really funny. When I came to Western in 1980, uh, we have no lifestyle agreement like that. But it was kind of, you know, it, you're probably more spiritual if you don't drink alcohol and dancing is, eh, I don't know. Now our singles, they go wine tasting down the valley and come back and do swing dancing in the evening. We've had it at the seminary. It's just some of these things change. Uh, but alcohol is absolutely a debate for. But in some cases, that's a divide for. And some fellowships. What is another one? Yeah. Women in head coverings. Is that a... Now tell me, is that a debate for... Is there a debate in the... How about women and leadership? Is, is women in leadership, where does that fit? Divide for, debate for, decide for? 
All of them? <laughs> Where would you say it fits? Women in leadership. I have to ask your wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. I, you know, it's, this is the women in leadership. I was at an evangelical theological society meeting in 1986 or 85, maybe, in Atlanta. And we had the Battle of the Lexica. Uh, we had Wayne Grudem and his lexicons. We had Kathy Crager and her lexicons. Wayne is complementarian, and Kathy is egalitarian. And boy, they got up, and they're both uh, really good scholars, and they had their you know, arguments from the lexicon. And when we got done with that, I said, okay, been there, done that. We can move on to something more important. I have never made a wrong or prophecy in my life. It's still a huge, huge divide for in the church. In particular fellowships, you'll have people on perhaps on both, uh, on the different sides in women in leadership. Uh, but what will happen is the church as a church has to decide what role women will have in leadership. And again, there's not just one position. The egalitarian position is that in, uh, any office or ministry of the church is open equally to men and women. The, what I call complementarian elder is uh, that the office of elder is restricted to males but women can fulfill any other office of leadership that's not elder specific. The elder te complementarian teacher is that women cannot teach men in the church and there are strong proponents of all three of those. For example, let me just ask and see how well you know things. Where would Tim Keller be? Egalitarian, women are not elders, women don't teach men. He's PCA, Presbyterian Church of America. Tim Keller, Redeemer Press, New York City. Does anybody know? Yes, can we ask some Presbyterians here? Uh, the PCA denomination is women don't teach men. Tim Keller is women can do anything but be elders. So he's actually in differentiation with his own denomination at that point. Uh, where would Mark Driscoll be, my co-author? Egalitarian, women are not elders, women don't teach men. Where would Mark be? He's women are not elders. He started out as women don't teach men. I rubbed his nose in the Bible and he changed to my <laughs> position. <laughs> That's actually true. Uh, that's one of the places where I did have influence on Mark as he dug in deeper because he began as women don't teach men. But as he got to looking at scripture, Acts 18, for example, where Priscilla and Aquila take Apollos and te correct his doctrine, and that's presented in a positive context. You realize, well, here's a woman teaching a man doctrine. And you can say, well, it's not public. Yeah, but see, teaching a man is not just a public thing. It's a teaching thing. So Mark has come to the spot where uh, women are not elders, but women can do other leadership roles in the church. And that's an evolving kind of thing. I'm sorry, say it just a little bit louder. Right. Uh, yeah, if a woman stands on stage and is shepherding the congregation on a steady basis, in almost all churches, that's an elder role. So if you hold that women are not elders, then you do not have women on stage teaching the whole church on a regular basis. The place where they're, and that's where Mark is, and that's where I would be too. I, I'm, I, think, women, I think biblically women are not elders. Uh, the question is, could a woman teach a combined class uh, Sunday school class, there would be men in it uh, doing, say, you know, the Gospel of Mark or something like that. And that's where the differentiation comes. I think that a woman could do that because I don't think that's an elder-specific job. Uh, if you say that women shouldn't teach men, then they can't do that. Uh, I'm not, because those what's 
The question is, how can you talk about specific roles for elders? Local churches make those definitions. The basic role of an elder is to guide and guard the doctrine and life of the church. And it's a team of people. I mean, this is a fairly standard definition of elder. Elder is the team of people, I would say men, who guide and guard the life and teaching of the church. Exactly how that works out, Scripture doesn't say, but that's the role that they have. And then under the elders, you have deacons and you have members. Yes, I think the Bible teaches that women can hold the elders. Let me just show it to you. Uh, look at... What time is it? Yeah, okay, we'll do this and take a break. We're way off topic, but it's normal. First uh, Timothy chapter 2. Sorry, First Timothy chapter 3. If you look down in verse 8, uh, this is going to vary a bit according to translation. First Timothy 2.8. Uh, uh, sorry, First Timothy 3.8. I said it wrong. 1 Timothy 3.8, uh, uh, it says here, this is NIV, In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, not indulging in much wine, <laughs> not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep the deep truths of the faith with clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then there's nothing against let them serve in the same way. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. And then verse 12, a deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and household well. This is what I think it is. In teaching about elders, there's nothing stated there about women elders or wives of elders. In this case, I think, and again, there's debate on this, uh, verses 8 through 10 as deacons, is talking about deacons in general. Verse 11 is talking about women deacons. And verse 12 is talking about men deacons. This is NIV 2011. Hang on just a second. Let me finish my thought. I'll come back and talk about the translational issue. But at first I want to understand this position. Because this is a debated point. Hello. Yeah. So what I'm suggesting is that 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 10 is about deacons in general. 1 Timothy 3, 11 is about women deacons. And 1 Timothy 3, 12 is about men deacons. Now, if you look in some other translations, 1 Timothy 3, 11 will say in the same way, the wives must be worthy of respect and so on and it will be a limitation on the wives of deacons. The odd thing is, why would you have a limitation on wives of deacons and not have a limitation on wives of elders? When everybody agrees that elder is the higher office. It just makes no exegetical sense, seems to me. If you put limitations on wives of deacons, the lower office, the ministry team leader office, why would you not put some restriction on wise of elders, which is the higher ruling office? So just by the flow of the text, it seems to me that the way it would be is 1 Timothy 3.11 would be translated as NIV and New American Standard do, and say in the same way, the women. The Greek word there is gune, and that can be wives or women. It's the same word that's in 1 Timothy 2.12. And what is it in 1 Timothy 2.12? Paul says, I do not allow what to teach or have authority. That's not wives, that's women. There's no reason why you'd change the translation of the term from 1 Timothy 2.12 to 1 Timothy 3.8, unless there's some contextual reason, and I don't think there is. I think in both cases he's talking about women. So in 1 Timothy 3.11, I think... That's talking about wives of deacons. Or sorry, that's talking about women deacons, not wives of deacons. Now, again, this is a debated point. I'm not pretending like I'm speaking for the whole church here. But that's why I look at it. So I think, yes, there are women deacons. And in Romans 16, it begins that long list of exemplary people in the church by talking about Phoebe, who is a diaconate. 
and some translation will translate that as a servant, which is possible, seems to be more likely that she's a deacon. And again, this is a debated issue, uh, whether you can have women deacons or not, and it has to do with your whole thing. Uh, that clock says 8 o'clock. Why don't we take 10 minutes, and we'll come back and talk about some more of this. I've, uh, I want to tie together and say, how do we pull these together? So 10 minutes, not 11, 10 minutes. <laughs>